With J.D. Martinez now in place, could Mark Vientos start the year in AAA? I'll break down what the Mets should do on today's edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you uh, amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. J.D. Martinez is a New York Met. I did a live show right after it happened, and of course, that was raw. It was real. It was me excited about the move. Now I've had some hours here to chew on it, to think about it more. And I wasn't planning to do another show for the day, but I decided, you know what? The live reaction show can stand on its own, but I want to talk a little bit more about how this relates to Mark Vientos because I did spend a lot of time on that live reaction show trying to talk myself into a role on the MLB roster for Mark Vientos. And there is an argument to be made that here's how it it sort of breaks down to me, right? Across a two-week span, let's say the Mets play 13 games. You got 26 starts between DH and third base that could be given out here. Martinez, in that two-week span, he might only need one day off because if he gets a day off one week, he might only need one day away from being DH. So there's one start for Mark Vientos, and let's say you face two lefties a week. So maybe he gets five starts in a two-week span. Then I really think about it more, right? So five starts in 13 games extrapolate that out over a full season. He's only going to be playing 62 games last year. He played 65 games, got 233 plate appearances. Is that the best thing for Mark Vientos? Now there's the other side of it. He has spent a ton of time in triple A already over the last two years. He has spent a full season, 162 games in triple A, and he had 11 games in triple A in 2021. So 173 career games in triple A. And now he might be on a one-way ticket right back to Syracuse. And that's rough. And so I I kept on the original show trying to talk myself into it, right? Because you want to see Vientos up. When, you know, Brett Beatty's on the bench, you want to see Mark Vientos at third base, not Zach Short or Jose Iglesias or Joey Wendell. You want as many good hitters on this team as possible. But is withering away on the bench really the best thing? And so then the more I think about it too, I'm also wondering, all right, What about a platoon at third? Is that the best thing for Brett Beatty even? Brett Beatty, last year, he played 108 games, 389 plate appearances. If he started nine out of every 13 games this year, he get 112 starts. So a little bit more than last year. Maybe he's only getting 400 plate appearances. The more you start to do that math, the more you realize having both of them on this roster might not be the best thing. And then you compare their spring trainings. Okay, so who's won the job? If it's a head-to-head competition, well, Brett Beatty has homered in his last two games. This month, in 12 games played, Beatty is hitting 294 with a 385 on base, a 588 slug. He is 10 for his last 34 with three home runs, a double, and here's the big one, four walks to five strikeouts. Mark Vientos, on the other hand, hitting 214, 250 on base, 548 slug, nine for 42, Four home runs, which is great. Two doubles. He's slugging, but two walks to 16 strikeouts, 16 Ks, and 42 at bats. When you really break it down like that, if this is a competition, Brett Beatty has won. And we know he's the better defensive third baseman. And then when you think about the role on this team, who should that role go to? If it's Mark Vientos, all of a sudden, you're talking yourself into you know, having J.D. Martinez rest a little bit more. You're talking yourself into pulling Beatty out of the lineup a little bit. But the best thing for Brett Beatty is probably to play nearly every single day. You know, If you have a devastating lefty on the mound, if the Mets are playing the Braves and Chris Sales on the mound, or Max Freed, even worse, yeah, maybe in those situations you get a right-handed bat. We'll talk about that in the next segment, who that right-handed bat would be, to start over at third base. That, that makes sense, of course. 
If Mark Vientos was on the team, sure, he could be in those matchups, but it's such a limited amount of playing time. So then now you got to talk him into, okay, you're going to AAA. You spent this entire offseason gearing up to be the DH, the spring training as well. You hit some home runs. You felt good about yourself. I'm sorry. On the eve of the season, nearly, you're going back to AAA. That's a, a tough, tough pill for Mark Vientos to swallow. And that's why I think I was on the live show trying to talk myself out of that being the eventual scenario. But here's the thing. David Stearns has said throughout the offseason, the Mets are always going to be in the market to add talent. And he's discussed the idea of getting all these young players time. But one of the things he said recently is that doesn't have to be on opening day. He said the same thing when it came to the pitchers. This is a long season. And Mark Vientos will get his shot at some point. I think it'd be a stretch to think that Brett Beatty, J.D. Martinez, and Pete Alonso are all going to be completely healthy and playing 150 games plus. Be amazing if that happens. But chances are, especially when J.D. Martinez is, what, 36 years old? Chances are, at some point, J.D. is going to pull a hammy for a little bit or, or, or have his back flare up, and he's going to need a 10-day aisle stint and Mark Vientos can come up and play every day, and it would be great if he had already been playing every day in AAA prior to that, was in a good rhythm. And if you send him to AAA, he could play third base every single day, work on his defense, and that's what you're probably telling him. You're going to go to AAA, but you are going to play every single day, and we want you to improve defensively at third base because guess what? If Brett Beatty flops, I'm not going to tell him this, but that's just the reality. If Brett Beatty uh, takes this spring, he's been playing great, goes over into the season and is awful through you know all of April, and Mark Vientos is tearing the cover off the ball, well, they can flip those two guys. That's probably the best thing for their development at this point. Obviously, for Mark Vientos, he has earned throughout his minor league time the right to be on a big league roster, but unfortunately, the Mets big league roster just got too good for him to be on it. And you know what? When you're in AAA, you're also playing for the other 29 teams. And if Vientos is having a monster season in AAA, while Brett Beatty is doing very well as the starting third baseman and J.D. Martinez is healthy and playing well, at the trade deadline, if he has shown that he can play third base as well on top of it, there might be a team that's really interested in acquiring Mark, Mark Vientos, and he might just get his chance to play every day for another organization. So this is you know, really uh, – Unfortunate turn of events for him personally, but it's definitely the best thing for the Mets as far as this season. And, you know, I think there is a world where Vientos can still turn this into a positive if he takes it the right way and continues to just focus on himself and his game wherever he's playing. But uh, the more I thought about it after recording that initial show, I realized I was wrong with some of the things I was saying there at kind of the, the gut reaction to the news. And so I figured it was worth it to hop on and record again. And that now leads me into the next segment here, which is if Vientos is going to be in AAA, which the more I think about it, I think that's the likely outcome. Who grabs that last bench spot? So I want to go through that in the next segment. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to Busted Brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines, and you can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. You can bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. You can also bet on MLB futures. Got to see if the Mets over under win total gets adjusted after signing J.D. Martinez. It's previously set at 81 and a half. Not sure if they're going to bump that up a win or not. Uh, but if it's still there, 81 and a half, I'd grab it. Pete Alonso, 41 and a half on his home runs for the season. Take the over now. He's going to get more pitches to hit. So that's an exciting development. You want to play MLB Futures, you can do that at FanDuel. And again, you place that $5 bet on a tournament game. You win it. $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Today's episode is also brought to you by Ibotta. We could always use a little extra cash in our pockets, so make sure you're getting cash back on all of your everyday purchases with Ibotta. 
Ibotta is a free app that gives you the most cash back every time you shop on hundreds of items from groceries to beauty supplies and more. The average Ibotta user earns $145 per year. That could cover the cost of an entire trip to the grocery store. Other apps still give you points that don't amount to much. With Ibotta, just add your offers in the app, upload your receipt, and you get real cash that you can cash out to your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. Join the over 50 million savers and earn cash back every time you shop from over 2,700 brands and retailers, including Lowe's, Macy's, Sephora, Best Buy, and more. And right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using the code LOCKEDONMLB when you register. Just go to the App Store, Google Play Store, and download the free Ibotta app to start earning cash back. Again, use that code Locked on MLB. That's Ibotta, I B O T T A, in the Google Play or App Store, and use that code Locked on MLB. Bad news for Mark Vientos might have been good news for Zach Short. I've been talking about Short over the last couple of weeks here, saying there's always that shot that he might grab that last bench spot. And he had a great game today, hit a grand slam. So now he improved his March numbers. He is really hitting the ball well. He is nine for 25 in March, two doubles, a home run, five walks to four strikeouts. He's hitting 360, 467 on base, 560 slug to 25 plate appearance sample size. But here's an interesting thing that I found as well. A baseball savant, you can look up, uh, you know, searchable stats for spring training. So I looked up average exit velocity on a minimum of 50 pitches seen this spring. Who is number one on the New York Mets when it comes to average exit velocity? Who is hitting the ball harder than anyone in camp? Do you think Mark Vientos, Pete Alonzo, Francisco Alvarez, hey, maybe even Brett Beatty or Brandon Nimmo or Francisco Lindor? No. It's Zach Short. He is leading the New York Mets in average exit velocity in spring training. Now, it's spring training. It's a small sample size, but the point is, he is hitting the ball really hard. His average active velocity, 95.1 miles per hour. And then you look at his at bats against lefties this spring. He's five for 12. So I know there's a lot of buzz right now or a lot of fandom behind Jose Iglesias. He's made some highlight plays in the field. He you know hit a walk-off homer. He's hitting 294 in camp. He's doing a good job as well. But to me, Zach Short is the favorite now assuming the Mets do start Mark Vientos in AAA to grab that last bench spot. And you compare the two guys, Iglesias does have more MLB experience, but last year who was on an MLB roster? Zach Short was. Iglesias is 34 years old, Short is 28. So athletically, Short's definitely in his prime. Iglesias hasn't played third base since 2013. Where do the Mets need some help? Third base. Zach Short last year played third, short, and second. Got at least 16 starts at all three of those positions. He also played eight innings in the outfield. It's not a ton, but the Mets can stick him out there if they need him, if they need to. In a pinch, clearly, Joey Wendell and Zach Short do a lot of the same things. But they bat from a different side. So Zach Short could be your right-handed utility infielder. Wendell, you're a left-handed utility infielder. And I think the way this team is constructed now, Everything has changed by adding J.D. Martinez because now, all right, you thought Starling Marte is going to get some run at DH. All of a sudden, is he? I don't think he necessarily is. So let's just say, all right, you're going to get Starling Marte off his feet for a game. But Harrison Bader is just getting killed against right-handed pitching. You want Tyrone Taylor out in the game. There's a righty on the mound. What do you do? All of a sudden, you could slide Jeff McNeil into right field. Joey Wendell starts at second. I, I think there's going to be potentially a little bit more McNeil in the outfield now if you do carry short in Wendell. And that, that gives you a lot of versatility between those three guys to be able to do a lot of different things. I don't know how much those guys even play, though. I mean, I can see a world where you know Martinez is in the lineup every day. You know, Alonzo's in there every day. Nimmo, Lindor. The Mets might get a little bit brave this year where they're playing guys a ton, and that's that's a good strategy sometimes to get through the regular season and win a lot of baseball games. And so in that instance, not bad to have a couple glove first guys on your bench. And you know, if the Mets, hey, they got J.D. Martinez now, they put up a couple four spots in the game, they're winning eight to two, 
Well, now you can put in Wendell and Short to you know take Jeff McNeil and and Francisco Lindor off their feet in the game and, and go through the rest of, of that blowout and, and get the victory. So I, I think that it makes a lot of sense to go with a right-handed infielder to complement this roster now, particularly at third base, because all right, if like I said before, Max Freed is on the mound and you don't want Brett Beatty to face him. Well, yeah, you could put Joey Wendell out there, but he's not going to fare much better. Maybe Zach Short's got a shot going out there, being a right-handed bat to face the lefty. Um, this team now, it doesn't make a lot of sense to put G-Man Choi on the roster. Backup first baseman, do you really need that? Because I think they can stick Joey Wendell at first base if they had to. Um, Jeff McNeil can play first base if they wanted to. They can put um, you know, Zach Short at first base. Like, they can find a, a first base option. I don't know how much. I don't think J.D. Martinez has played much of any first base. But also, I think Pete's perfectly happy starting 155 to 160 games at first base. Um, so I don't know what value Choi brings when you – sort of remove that element of him being the left-handed compliment to Mark Fientos at DH. You're certainly not complimenting anybody for Martinez. Same thing with DJ Stewart. Where's the value there? Same thing with Luke Voigt. I mean, I guess if you wanted a left-handed bat off of the bench, but I think at this point, the Mets are just going to be rolling with their regulars for the most part. So we'll see. Maybe they do decide that it's worth it um, to keep a Stewart or a Choi, but I just think you're you're clogging up the bench a little bit um, where a guy like Zach Short, I mean, he can go into the game. He can run for you too. There's a lot of things that will make Carlos Mendoza's life a little bit easier, uh, especially when now the DH spot is clogged. Now, that's just the way it is. But with all that said, when it comes to that DH spot in that new edition, I talked about a lot of things with J.D. Martinez on the live stream show. But what I did not discuss properly is the exact language of this contract he signed because I didn't have the information when I hit record. Now we know, and the Mets got an absolute steal on the J.D. Martinez deal. Yes, it's one year, $12 million on paper, but there's a lot of deferred money here, which factors into luxury tax, and it just makes this look like an absolute masterclass by David Stearns. I want to break down that contract in the final segment, but first, today's episode is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's the opening weekend for baseball, the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV, especially because they recently added their Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On, and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all the latest game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on the world of sports. If you don't have Fire TV, check it out. The Fire TV channels are available on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on fire TV. For all of you everyday listeners of the show, now is the time to become Locked On Mets insiders to join our texting service where you get updates from me anytime. Some news breaks on the Mets. The first thing I did when J.D. Martinez signed, I sent out an update to Subtext and I let them all know that I was going live on YouTube. So that can keep you queued in to everything I got going on with the Mets coverage. Also, you can ask me questions anytime. This is where we'll be sending our lineups out every day so you can see who the Mets starting nine is going to be. And it's where we're running our Locked On Mets giveaways. First one of the year is going to be a Brett Baby signed photo. If you want to get in on this giveaway, all the details will be provided to our insiders next week. So find the link in the episode description or go to subtext.com slash Locked On Mets. All right, let's talk about the J.D. Martinez contract because, boy, did he fall into the Mets' laps. We heard one year, $12 million, And that on the surface was great, right? Because Justin Turner got $13 million on a one-year deal with the Blue Jays. Mets got J.D. Martinez, a better hitter, cheaper. Jorge Soler got a three-year deal for $42 million. $14 million a season, more than Martinez got in multiple years. Reese Hoskins got two years, $34 million. 
Teoscar Hernandez, one year, 23 and a half million, a bunch of money deferred there, but regardless, really good deals, right? Uh, a really good deal, I should say, for the Mets. Well, then it got juicier. Okay, according to Andy Martino, JD Martinez gets four and a half million dollars now and seven and a half million dollars in deferrals. So this season, it's four and a half mil. According to John Heyman, two and a half of that is a signing bonus. So he gets two and a half million dollars now. And then for the rest of the season, he's getting paid Joey Wendell money. Throughout the rest of this contract, when you get to 2034, that's when the deferrals kick in. He'll get one and a half million dollars every year for five years after he should be long retired at that point. But for the Mets, it's four and a half million dollars right now for Steve Cohen. That's what he's paying. And then when it comes to the luxury tax implications, Christopher Soto does a great job on Twitter. You can find him at Soto C eight Oh three. We work together at Metsmerize um, in the past. And I always go to him because he's an accountant and he likes to crunch the numbers on all this luxury tax stuff. So he calculated the present money value of JD Martinez's deals. This is looking at the deferrals, what that's going to come out to. Remember, this is the same thing that happened with Shohei Otani where his $700 million contract broke out to whatever it was, 400 and whatever, 460. I can't remember the exact dollar amount, but that's how the luxury tax hit was so much better for the Dodgers. So for the Mets, a $12 million deal because of the deferrals becomes $8.996 million. So instead of having to pay whatever that would have been, uh, 25 and change when it comes to luxury tax penalties, this comes out to $18.8 million for Steve Cohen. Still a lot of money for a DH, but when you're paying you know, the amount of taxes he already is, really not that bad. His hit is less than Harrison Bader's hit, for example. And let's go even further. When you're talking about the money that they're actually paying J.D. Martinez this year, Okay, so not no the, the tax hit is different from, of course, what's actually you know going to Martinez. He's getting four and a half million this season. That means he's getting paid the same as Adam Adovino. He's getting less than Adrian Hauser, Brooks Raley, Omar Narvaez, and Harrison Bader, and amongst others, of course, Jeff McNeil, Brendan Emma, Francisco Lindor, Pete Alonso, all those guys, um, Severino, Manaya. But here's the the funny one: James McCann's going to get paid eight million dollars by the New York Mets this season from having to buy out his contract to send him to Baltimore. So he's getting three and a half million dollars more in the calendar year of 2024 than JD Martinez is with the New York Mets. It's nuts. A couple other contracts to look at Whit Merrifield gets $8 million this year from the Phillies. So he's getting paid three and a half million dollars more this season. Uh, we look at the present money value. Those deals are nearly the same. Joey Gallo with the Nationals, five mil. So it is crazy the steal that the Mets had here by waiting this out for J.D. Martinez. I said this on the live stream. If Billy Opler was the Mets GM, J.D. Martinez would be on the Mets, but it'd be on a two-year $40 million deal. And now, by waiting it out to the very end, by staying true to the fact that we don't need J.D. Martinez, you got, you got Mark Vientos. We want to see what we have in Mark Vientos. I'm sure anytime that Scott Boris called him up, he said, look, the money's got to come down a lot. We don't have anything in the budget for this. You know, we, we got to be creative. And ultimately what happened here is there was no market. And whatever the angels were offering, whatever that dollar amount was, maybe it was the same thing. Maybe it was $12 million straight. For J.D. Martinez to go out and play baseball this season at his age, he wants to go somewhere where he's actually excited to play. So why last year he took a $10 million deal with the Dodgers. So he wanted the Mets, which makes sense because every other day we had John Heyman sending out tweets. And it's funny because as soon as I finally said I was sick and tired of this, I sent out a tweet uh, two days ago where it was another, the Mets have submitted an offer, blah, 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 which we also saw like an hour before he signed that there was, uh, what was it like? No, no formal offers on the table or, or the Mets and Angels had submitted bids, but they're nowhere close. And then all of a sudden, boom, he signs. Regardless, there was so much smoke all off season because I think it's pretty clear when J.D. Martinez canvassed the league, just like we did on that podcast a couple months ago or at the beginning of February, where I looked at all 30 teams and the fits that were out there, the Mets were the obvious fit. It's a chance to go to a team where it could hit in a good lineup and – Maybe win something. And here we go. 
after a long time of waiting, he ends up settling for four and a half million dollars this year and seven and a half million dollars deferred. And I know it's great to get that two and a half million dollars up front. And he's not complaining, he's still getting paid very well to play baseball, but this is certainly not the deal anyone was expecting. The Mets got a steal here. One last stat or note to close out the show. And I'm not going to touch the, the Jordan Montgomery stuff until it happens. It seems like if he does sign, we'll sign, but it seems like they might wait till the season starts because after the season starts, if he signs a contract with the team, he won't be eligible to get a qualifying offer attached. So if he wants to sign one of these Boris specials, the three-year deal with the opt-out, he'll have to wait. So we'll have time for that if we even want to revisit it. But we're talking the Mets offense. And on the live stream, I said the Mets are comparable to the Phillies now offensively. So I looked at roster resource, the starting nine of the Phillies, the starting nine of the Mets, and I looked at the Zips projections. When it comes to wins above replacement, the Phillies starting nine is projected to have an F4 of 20.6, the Mets 24.3. The Phillies are projected to hit 150 home runs, the Mets 167. And this is just the starting nines. The Phillies are projected to have four hitters with a WRC plus over 100. So four hitters that will be above league average. The Mets, six hitters with a WRC plus over 100. The Mets offense is going to be right there with the Phillies. Now their pitching is nowhere close, and that's why the Phillies are still clearly the better team. But this Mets team can compete. And if you can bridge that gap on the pitching defense, geez, on the pitching difference, I was trying to get defense out because that's where I was going. With good defense, if that's how you can get closer to the Phillies, that's where your pitchers should have a 4-5 ERA, but it's 3-5 because Harrison Bader's patrolling center field with Brandon Nimmo and left. If the defense can be there and the bullpen's great and your offense is good to keep you in a bunch of games, the Mets actually can really compete in this wild card race and even compete with the team that on paper is a lot better than them in the Philadelphia Phillies. Anyway, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked on Mets. As you can tell, I am more fired up about this team than I've been in a while. So don't be surprised if there's a little Saturday show for you this weekend. If you don't want to miss it and you're listening on the audio side, follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. I'm trying to get up to 9,000 subs now uh, so then we can get to the big goal of 10,000. I appreciate all of you who hit subscribe. You can follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked on Mets. You want to be in on the Brett Beatty sign giveaway? Find a link in the episode description to become a Locked On Mets insider or go to subtext.com slash Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen or your first watch every day. Now for your second watch, head over to Locked On Sports today to check out the first ever 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube that covers everything in the world of sports with our local experts for each team and our league-wide experts for each league. If I Locked On Sports today, streaming 24-7 on YouTube.